mystery, history, cryptid creatures, and paranormal activities. This is the Creeps and Crawls Mystery Hour Podcast, and as always, I'm your host, Creeps. Today's episode comes with a warning, again, sadly. This one also has a trigger warning of rape, kidnapping, and mutilation. Um, if you are sensitive to these topics, I do not recommend you listen in. It is very tough for me to read about as well, so if you hear me shaking or having any pauses that are a little longer than usual, that is why. But as always, here we go. Lawrence Bittiger was born in the early hours on September 27, 1940, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Had his parents known he would become the notorious murderer he is known as today? Did they know the baby that they gave up because they did not want kids would grow up to be a heinous sicko? Is that why they gave him up? No, they just never wanted children. And that's why he was placed in an orphanage, where he was swiftly adopted. His adopted family was consistently moving in his younger years, his father being an aviation worker. And even at the age of 12, this criminal was already gaining himself a record. He was first arrested for shoplifting at the age of 12. And... His repertoire for being a criminal only grows, and over the next four years, he had many different accumulations of what he did, including shoplifting, car theft, petty theft. Growing up, it is said that he knew no love. Maybe he had been placed in another home, or if he had stayed with his original family, or brought to a simple reform school, he could have changed. But it seems he would never change his ways. He even decided school was boring despite having a very high IQ for the time, and dropped out in 1957. By this stage, his family, broken, was living in California. And after dropping out, he was arrested for car theft, hit and run, and resisting arrest. And he was imprisoned in the California Youth Authority, where he sat until he turned 18. And when he was released, he found his adopted parents had abandoned him and disowned him, and moved to a different state, leaving him all alone, and further ostracizing him from the world, and ever reforming into a decent man. He never saw his adoptive parents again. The next of these two not-so-gentlemanly men is Ray Norris, who was born on February 5, 1948, in Colorado, and was conceived out of wedlock, and his parents were forced to wed in a loveless marriage to avoid stigma around his birth. He grew up surrounded by extended family because his grandfather owned real estate and his father worked in the scrapyard while his mother was a drug-addicted housewife. And because of this, he went from family to foster family to family again, his whole adolescence never knowing one home. And when he was with his family, he was often accused wrongfully of things he did not do. He was neglected and sexually assaulted and some awful things happened under the care of a Hispanic family, which caused him to have a very racist view, and I do not agree with any of those views, just to let you know. When he was 16 and living with his family, he verbally sexualized a female relative in her 20s, who told him to leave and informed his father, who threatened him, and then <laughs> followed up by beating the ever-loving crap out of him. He then stole his father's car, drove up to the Rocky Mountains, and attempted suicide by injecting air into an artery in his arm, and he was later apprehended as a runaway and returned to live with his parents, who told him of him and his sister's unwanted births, which 
somehow psychologically affected him quite well. <laughs> and they intended on divorce when they were younger, but decided when both children reached adulthood a year later, they would, in fact, divorce. Norris then dropped out of school and joined the Navy, in which he was stationed in San Diego in 1965 and was deployed to serve in Vietnam. And although he never saw active combat, he was honorably discharged from the Navy after one tour. Shortly after this, he would be arrested on an unknown charge of sexual assault. Three months later, in February of 1970, he would be arrested for a break-in that could have went much worse. And less than three months later, in May of 1970, while on bail, he attacked a female student that he had been stalking for a long while. He repeatedly struck her on the back of the head with a rock until she slumped to her knees, then repeatedly bashed her head on the sidewalk as he knelt on her lower back, and shortly after this, he would be charged for assault with a deadly weapon. He was then committed to a five-year imprisonment that was classified with a mental disordered sex offender title. He was later released in 1975 with five years probation. He was then declared no longer dangerous to himself and others, but just three months after this release, he attacked and raped a woman who declined his advances, and although the rape was reported to the police, they were unable to find Norris until one month later when his bike was spotted and the victim wrote down his license plate number that was then given to police and initiated Norris's swift arrest. He was then convicted for this and sent to a California men's colony in San Luis Az Abiso Abispo and then incarcerated. This is where he met his future partner in crime, Bittaker. From February to June in 1975, Norris and Bittaker picked up over 20 female hitchhikers. They did not rape them, but used it as practice for their later more nefarious runs. And in late April, the duo found an isolated fire road along the San Gabriel Mountains and broke open the locked gate with a crowbar, replacing the previous one with their own. And the first of their brutal mur murders... Lucinda Lynn Schaefer. She was only 16, and on June 24th, 1979, she was last seen leaving a church meeting in Renando Beach. In Bittaker's written accounts, he states that he and Nurse first finished a bed they had installed in the rear of a van they were using, which they placed tools, clothes, a cooler, and drinks, and approximately 11 a.m., the pair drove to the beach and were drinking beers, smoking weed, and flirting with girls. And at 7.46 p.m., Nora spotted Schaefer walking towards her grandmother's home, and, and they referred to her as a cute little blonde that they would successfully lure her into their van, turn the volume all the way up, bind and gag her with duct tape, and drive to the fire road where they had first raped, then decided who should kill her. And here is where the men's accounts get skewed. See, Bittaker claimed only to being a second to murder, saying Nora strangled her. But Norris claims he ran away scared, and that Bittaker finished the strangulation, until she collapsed, where a coat hanger was then wrapped round her neck with pliers, until she stopped convulsing. Her body was then wrapped in plastic, a plastic shower curtain of sorts, and thrown into a canyon, and Bittaker assured Norris she would be eaten by animals and no evidence would be left the next day. <laughs> the next in their horrifyingly increasing murder spree would be two weeks later where the encountered 18-year-old Andrea Hill They would pull up to her on July 8th, 1979, and offer a ride, but she would be offered by another driver as well, so she did not take their offer and drove away, but the now duo would follow from a distance until Hall exited the vehicle around Redondo Beach. When they pulled up, Norris hid in the back, making Bittaker look as though he was a lone traveler. He offered Hall a drink, to which she agreed, but... 
that's when they struck. Norris pounced on Hall, and after a strenuous fight, Norris subdued her and made her scream out by twisting her arm, then gagged her with tape and bound her wrists and ankles. They took her where they took Schaefer two weeks prior, where she was also raped, forced to take Polaroids, and then they drove her to a third location, a nearby hill, where more Polaroids were taken, an ice pick was then shoved through her head, and then they strangled her and threw her over a cliff. The murders get increasingly violent, and a lot goes down, but most go exactly this way. There are two more known murders, that we have, and I'll just drop the names and spare the brutal details. Shirley Lynette Ledford was also raped, beaten, and taken Polaroids of, then thrown into, embank into an embankment on Halloween of 1979. Their most famous murder, and their final one, was an unknown woman with no name, and no body was ever found, but it was in Bideker's journal, and he had also raped and beaten this woman, and threw her over the same exact canyon as the first murder. He did not take Polaroids of her, however, but in November of 1979, her plans, their plans would start to foil. Norris became acquainted with Joseph Jackson, a man who he met at the California Men's Colony, who Norris would confide in his exploits with Bideker, to which he explained in a harsh graphic detail to Jackson about what him and his partner had been up to the last five months, including graphic details about the only body that had been found at this time, Shirley Ledford. He also told him of three separate incidents that they had harmed women but did not kill them while picking them up because they had escaped or, in one instance, had been let go of by their attackers after being raped. I'm sorry. And upon hearing these confessions, Jackson consulted his attorney who advised him to inform the authorities, and Jackson immediately complied. Investigators swiftly staffed the investigating team and began investigating the murders and rapes that took place between June to October of 79 and noted the lineup of some missing girls in the area to Jackson's, Jackson's statement of Norris's confession, as well as the woman who had been released. Both men were identified by the woman, and then they were observed dealing pot on November 20th, 1979, and Norris were a parole violation. In the same day, Bideker was arrested for the rape of a woman they released, but although they had already been identified, she could not identify them in a lineup. But while that was the case, police had seen Nora stealing pot, and Bideker was also found possessing drugs, and both were had, uh, held on a violation of parole. But eventually, the Polaroid fo photos would come to light after searching Bideker's apartment, as well as some tools used in the murders and this made the murders easy to solve from here. With the positive identification of Ledford's photo and a bracelet, they started the charges on the men, with haste, and on November 30th, Norris attended his preliminary hearing, where he showed visible signs of distress. He waived his Miranda rights and confessed initially, but later on would deny such claims, and... When his evidence started being shown to him, he then began confessing everything again. But he did not portray Bideker as the main murderer and more brutal as murderers went on. And they found 19 photos in their possession of women who had gone missing. So many more were now sus suspected of being murdered. They gave away where they dumped the bodies and the only ones retrieved were the ones mentioned before 1980. Norris pleaded guilty at his trial, and per his plea deal was not sentenced to the death penalty. Bideker did not answer when asked to plea and refused to answer any questions, and the judge entered a not guilty plea on his behalf. Bideker eventually denied any confessions to the murder and pled that he had paid Hall for her pictures and to pose for her Polaroids with him. After agreeing to 200 for sex, he claimed that Norris had walked her to the San Gabriel Mountains before returning alone and informing Bideker that he had told Hall to find her way home, and he claimed that the same for the others as well. He claimed that 
he had heard the scream of lead fur, and he thought that it was merely theatrical, and she was never tortured in his presence. Later, Bittaker would be charged for five accounts of first-degree murder, one charge of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, five charges of kidnapping, nine charges of rape, two charges of forcible oral copulation, and one charge of sodomy, and three charges of unlawful possession of a firearm. Deliberations on whether Bittaker should have been sentenced to death or life without parole had been thought of, and on February 19, 1980, the jury deliberated for 90 minutes and returned with the verdict that he would be sentenced to death for showing no emotion towards his actions, and on Mo March 24, that verdict was then agreed upon, but would not be formally carried out. Instead, dying while incarcerated on December 13th, 2019 at the age of 79. And then Norris died while incarcerated at the age of 72 on February 24th, 2020. Both of these men were sick, and had they both had normal childhood childhoods, I'm still not sure if they would have ever been reformed. With no remorse for their own actions, they sat in jail and rotted, then died. But so much more should have been done. There may never be justice for what they did, and it's a cruel fate to the inflicted on those women. But for now, I want to remind you to stay creepy, my friends.